So today I'm really delighted to be joined by Terry Miller. Terry was one of those lawyers that I always heard people talk about in hushed tones during my career as an amazing and important lawyer, so that she almost seemed like a mystical character high up in the echelons at Goldman Sachs. But sadly, I never actually managed to meet her in person whilst I was practicing. And then my husband started singing Terry's praises when he came across her as a board member at Rossi Life, the company he works for. So I finally plucked up the courage and asked for an introduction. And I'm delighted that Terry is here today to tell us a bit about herself and to share some of her learnings from her long, distinguished and really interesting career. Welcome, Terry. Yes, welcome, Erica. I'm, I think my main reaction to hearing that introduction is to A, wonder if that's really me, and B, to start feeling really, really very old. But, um, oh, but it, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, it was definitely you. That's definitely you. Yes, yes. Uh, well, that's not my intention. So, but yes, no, I used to hear a lot. I used to hear your name a lot, but I never managed to, to meet you. So, you, so I'm so pleased when I finally did get to meet you. Well, I appreciate so, it. Yeah. So I was wondering, can I, can I take you back to the beginning? Because I think we'd really love to hear a bit about your background. Where did you grow up? Did you always want a career in law? What were your, what were your early years of practice like? like? Just, yeah, tell us a bit about yourself. Well, I didn't start out dreaming of being a lawyer when I was a child. And in fact, I always thought I was going to be a writer of some sort. And the first career that I had when I left university, I was actually a newspaper reporter. And one of the things that I did was to cover court cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and at some point, I decided that standing up and talking and ideally being able to do so in a persuasive and compelling way was something that I thought I could do. And the opportunity presented itself as it happened several years later. We moved to a new city. Um, I wasn't able to get a job as a newspaper reporter. Um, and they had, at that point, opened a law school in that city, and I decided to go to law school. Um, I have to say from the very beginning, I've always enjoyed both the this, this study of law, the academics, I think researching and finding applicable precedents, I find always still very engaging. But I think probably my most enjoyable role was when I became a lawyer at the Securities and Exchange Commission, I was ultimately chief of the enforcement branch of the Securities and Exchange Commission in the Washington regional area, Washington, D.C. Um, and that was fantastic because it was being able to investigate and prosecute cases, which meant that like an investigated journalist, I was deciding what I needed to pursue and how I needed to build the case, but I had subpoena power as well. So that was very helpful. And we had some really interesting cases. I was very lucky. We had a very high profile case, for example, involving Reverend Moon and the Unification Church. And because this, absolutely, and because this was a government agency with a fairly lean staff, I was able to take responsibility for cases, including that one, I think at an earlier point in my career than might otherwise have been the case. So that was great training. I loved that. And then decided after a period of time that it would make sense to think about moving into private practice. And there were a number of reasons for that. I think I felt that I had had a really good grounding, as it were, in a lot of the areas that were relevant to being a lawyer in the world of financial services by working for the Securities and Exchange Commission. But I also wanted to, I think, see what it was like to be part of building the confidence of the client and developing a sort of model for clients to pursue, particularly when we dealt with, as we did at that law firm, with people wanting to go public mm -hmm. um, to list shares. And that was a very interesting thing to do. Um, at the end of about six years or so at that law firm, my husband decided that he wanted to move to England. He's English. And we moved. And at that point, it happened to coincide with Big Bang. And there was a great premium on investment banks in particular looking for people that had experience of regulation. Mm -hmm. And so my Securities and Exchange Commission experience became very relevant. And I was headhunted by Goldman Sachs to become their second lawyer in London and only the third lawyer outside of the United States in 1989. Oh, wow. 
1989. So, well, wow, things have changed a lot since then. <laughs> Number two lawyer. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, well, yeah, go on, carry on. I was just going to say, well, I would assume there are people that are listening who were not born in 1989. Yeah. However, it was a very, very different world. And Goldman Sachs at that point was quite a small organization. It was very derivative of the business that was headquartered in New York. Mm -hmm. And obviously, over the intervening period until 2006, um, part of the immense fascination of that job was helping the business to grow. Yeah. Um, in Europe and um, in Asia, and ultimately to, um, I think, become responsible for all of the legal um, sort of activities outside of the United States, which is where my job eventually evolved. Yeah. I mean, taking you back, the, the decision to go from being a journalist to going back to law school, was that hard? Was it like, because I guess you'd been earning and then you had to decide, no, I'm going to invest in my career. Was that difficult? You know, I think there were questions in my mind about whether this was something I was really going to enjoy, first of all. Mm -hmm. However, the thing that I, I did find the fact that I had been in the workforce for a little while made me appreciate being back in school. You know, we it, it's a different kind of environment, um, but I think that was a good perspective for continuing the education after, after having the time in the workforce. So... Um, no, I don't think it was difficult. I actually worked throughout most of my law school career. I clicked for one of the local judges, which was very good because there was a very good practical understanding of the rules of, of civil procedure and trial procedure, which you, you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Mm -hmm. Oh, amazing. And then did you go straight to the Securities and Exchange Commission? How did you end up there? Yeah, so after I my final year of law school, I applied to a number of different U.S. federal government agencies. My husband at that point was keen to move to Washington from where we were. We were in Ohio. I applied to the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service. I'm not really sure why I did that. I had done a tax course, but in later years, I've started to think that maybe on a Wednesday afternoon, looking at the minutia of the tax code might not be the most exciting thing in the world. But I, I did have offers from several agencies and the Securities and Exchange Commission was one that appealed to me the most. Yeah. And of course, a lot of people, will, will pro, pro, when you say Reverend Moon and the Church of Unification, some people won't know what that is. I mean, I guess more commonly referred to as the Moonies. They used to, it used to be a big thing when we when I was young, these mass weddings that they used to hold that sort of effectively, I guess people would describe it as a cult. I don't know if they even still exist today. Yes, well, I think he. I think there was probably some challenges to the continuing growth of the movement mm -hmm. after he was um, imprisoned, convicted, and imprisoned of tax evasion um, in the 1990s, I believe. I think the issue there was that there had been funding provided to to a bank in Washington D.C. called Diplomat National Bank, which is basically Korean kind of government influence sources. And it was done by having a number of people become shareholders in the bank, mm -hmm. but they had no knowledge or understanding that they were shareholders. We interviewed probably 25 of them in New York. It was a joint effort with the control of the currency and the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York. And all of the people that we were able to interview, they had no understanding of the fact that they were shareholders. Um, mm -hmm. But that was the issue, and that was the reason for why the Securities and Exchange Commission was involved. Right. I mean, a great case, because it's always, you know, even as much as you may love the law, having something that is substantively interesting as, you know, as the, uh, the heart of the matter in terms of, you know, it, people understand what it is, it does make things uh, more interesting sometimes. And then we'll get onto that when we talk about the Olympic Committee. I mean, 1989 and the city and compared to now, I mean, just such different places. I mean, it'd be amazing to hear you talk about what it was like to go through that journey with the city, but also with Goldman. I mean, that that's about the time I think I started work and we, you know, I was not allowed to wear trousers to the office. It, you know, women were not allowed to wear trousers. And it seems, I think young people don't believe me when I tell them that story nowadays, but it was a completely different place. I agree. I mean, I had come from having been a partner in the law firm in Washington, which is where I had previously been before we moved to London, where the last 
public deal that I did, the client, primary client, was a woman who was responsible for a closed-end fund that was going to be listed. The broker that was responsible for the listing was headed, that team was headed by a woman, and I was the woman lawyer. And I remember saying this to people when I arrived in London, and it was just, people thought it, I was just making that up. You know, what? Are you, you know, that wasn't really the case. At that point, people in Washington were all the, all, I think it was very common for women to be wearing trouser suits. But the first time I wore one on the trading floor at Goldman Sachs, it did provoke commentary. My goodness. Yeah. And, you know, the, it was a very, the other thing I would say is that it was very, very common for me. I'm sure the same with you to be the only person Mm -hmm. in the room when there was a business discussion and people sometimes making the assumption that you were the secretary or were there to take orders for coffee. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of my favorite things that happened to me was I was with one of the law firms I worked for at an offsite. And I got into the lift with my husband because the other halves were invited and another US partner got in and introduced himself to my husband saying, well, it's so nice to meet someone from the London office. And he was like, no, no, I'm the husband. This is the partner. <laughs> so yes. um, that was some years yeah. later. So yeah, those assumptions continue. No, absolutely. And I think because, you know, my name is, my my formal name is Therese, but I've always been known as Terry. Mm-hmm. And that was a separate matter of confusion. So whenever people wanted to send something to me, which at that point it was often done in pieces of paper being mm-hmm. posted. I often found it being addressed to Mr. Terry Miller because nobody would have assumed that I was anything yeah. other than me on so. Yeah. And tell me, so what what were the learn the key learnings that you took away from being the main counsel to an organization that went through this incredible you know, period of growth in London, Europe, and I guess in the US at the same time? What what were your key lessons that you taught that you took away in terms of how to guide an organization through that? Well, I think there's two really big lessons when you have that kind of experience. The first thing is to recognize that you're never going to have an opportunity like that again to understand the business as it grows and to basically be a generalist. I mean, in the first instance, there were only two of us in Europe. Um, And so we handled everything that was coming up from the trading floor, from investment banking, from asset management. It was fantastic, right? I mean, very busy in many respects, but to be able to understand that range of businesses and to build a relationship with, at that point, we're a fairly small group of people. Mm -hmm. was amazing. So the the thing that I found really not challenging, but to think about how you wanted to develop your team as it became apparent that you were not not going to be able to do everything yourself. Mm -hmm. And the ability to think about what it means to develop the team and to delegate effectively. We've all had that issue where you think, I'm going to give somebody this particular job to do. Oh, I could do it so much faster, so much better. You have to resist that particular impulse or you will never be able to delegate Mm -hmm. effectively. Um, And to develop the right kind of oversight and be there if there were questions and to make sure that people could always come back to me on my team if they had a question. All of those things are absolutely essential to beginning to build out your own kind of sphere of influence and how you actually manage your responsibilities. Um, And I think we've all seen instances where people just find it really, really hard to let go. Yeah. And then there's there's no good outcome to that. Um, There isn't. They become overburdened. They're burnt out. They're stressed. They make the wrong decisions. Um, and at the same time, they're not getting the benefit of bringing in people who might know more than they do about a particular area, um, who might have more energy on a particular day, who might have more time on a particular day. Um, so I think that was the biggest lesson that that cusp when you've got to begin to delegate and decide how you want to do that and how to build from that. Yeah. I mean, it's something that I deal with a lot with coaches. I mean, one of the things that comes up quite a lot is but what if they're just not good enough? And and sometimes that is hard to deal with. I, mean, I don't know. Do you have an answer to that? If if obviously often no one is going to be as good as you, at least in your own opinion. So you have to accept that you might be able to do it better, but you'll be always doing it if you don't let go. But if 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 you feel you know if you feel the team isn't strong enough, how or or one someone in your team says I can't delegate because the people I'm delegating to aren't good enough at the moment. How would you answer that? 
Well, I think the important thing is to try to maintain a really regular source of contact, uh, contact with the team. So even as the team gets bigger, and I had a policy at Goldman Sachs of wanting people to actually have physical proximity to the businesses that they supported. So they actually had chairs, for example, on the trading floor, but they needed to come back to the legal department at least once a week for our weekly meetings. And obviously, I remained the person responsible for hiring, firing, and promoting them, which was really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, and I think having that point of contact at least once a week, what are you doing? How are you doing? Bear in mind that at that point, I would have had my own relationships with some of the key business heads, and I would check in from time to time to make sure that it was all working. I remember somebody telling me at an early stage, one of the business heads, so we really, really like this new hire. He's great. And we know you're not going to let him do anything stupid. I mean, which I think, you know, and that wasn't said in a patronizing way, but it meant that they knew that I had retained enough contact and the right kind of relationship with the lawyer to make sure that the business person could feel comfortable and actually to say to the business person, look, if there's something about this that's troubling you, you know, come and talk to me as well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we've all made mistakes. I mean, I think over the years about the things that I've done, I've never, you know, been in a situation where I can say, well, I've absolutely always done that 100% correctly. So sometimes you do have to let people make a mistake. You want them to tell you when they've made a mistake so that you can fix it. Mm -hmm. You always want to emphasize to the team that never try to self-medicate because it's mm -hmm. just, right? Um but I think that lesson about letting people go a little bit, but keep the tie in the right sort of way and make sure that they know that, you know, you're there to support them really is part of how that has to go. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And were you, were you in terms of thinking about things like that, like I've got to, I've got to really work on myself to get myself to delegate, were you, were you sort of strategic about it? Would you take time out to think about your career, think about how you were performing, or, or indeed have a coach, or were you just doing it on the job? I think in the first instance, it was more on the job. It was more identifying that there was some particular area that we knew was going to require quite a lot of focus and that I would, it either didn't have the bandwidth or didn't have the expertise. An example would be when we brought on board um, somebody who was the first in-house employment lawyer. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a big thing at that point. You tended to outsource it. And it was clear that there were ongoing um, challenges in terms of how we were building out the business, making sure we had an efficient recruitment process, you know, in situations where things didn't work out, that we had an appropriate and efficient process for dealing with issues, if we had redundancy programs, how those were managed, et cetera. Um, and I knew I didn't have that expertise and we therefore needed to find somebody same thing with certain types of derivatives. For example, as we began to build those businesses, I was really keen to make sure that we had people that understood those and would be able to work effectively with the business on sometimes very complicated structures. Yeah. So I don't think it, it was or it was more organic at that point and trying to think a little bit ahead of where we thought the business was going to go. I think as the years went on, I did have some coaching around how to continue to build out that kind of structure within the legal team. Mm -hmm. But by that time, we were pretty far down the road. So it, it wasn't something that caused me to make any significant changes. In right. what I was doing. And did you, I, I mean, because I'm, I'm a coach, I often ask people, have they had coaching? And, and did you find it helpful? Did you find it helpful? You can say, you can absolutely say no. <laughs> No, I did find it really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and we had some really interesting discussions. I mean, one of the things that we did was to figure out what my particular strengths were versus weaknesses, right? So, you know, if a strength was being able to analyze something as opposed to approaching it emotionally, you kind of like to know that, right? If your default is always to pause and take a breath and review things that's good if your instinct is to immediately rush in. Sometimes that's not a bad thing, but it's good to know that that might not, not, might not always yield the best result. We had a really interesting set of discussions around how I thought my, at that point, I, 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 I had become very passionately involved in equestrianism. And my view was that the power of the horse could do anything. 
And I suggested that there could be leadership courses developed around how people manage, you know, to deal with horses that were difficult or just to understand how they would form that relationship. And my coach got very excited about that, although we never did. Yeah. yeah no, well, now that obviously there's therapy using horses. Exactly. It isn't that far away. Yeah. Okay. So, so why don't we move on then to talk about this big sort of turn that your career then did? Tell, tell us a bit about that. Well, I was at that point a partner at Goldman Sachs and had responsibility for, I think, 180 people across legal as well as oversight responsibility for compliance and internal audit outside the U.S. Um, and I really was thinking at that point about stepping back. So I was in my, I mean, it seems impossibly young at this point, but I was in my late 50s and I thought, mm -hmm. gosh, I've been doing this for a while, traveling a lot. I'd really like to step out and perhaps work out a part-time role at Goldman Sachs. And just at that point in time, one of my colleagues was appointed as the CEO of the London 2012 Organizing Committee for the Olympic Games and Paralympic Games. And he um, said to me, you're not ready to retire yet. So I applied for the position of general counsel for mm -hmm. thinking to myself, this would, this is an opportunity you would never, ever want to pass up. Mm. I mean, I am really passionate about sport. My colleague, Paul Dighton, is an intensely competent, really good guy. Um, mm -hmm. I just thought, why would you not do this, right? Uh, and I was appointed. I mean, there was some, I think a lot of people applied, mm -hmm. and a lot of people applied, including people who weren't lawyers, who said, I'm not a lawyer, but I could do this, <laughs> right? Which is interesting. And I joined the organizing committee in 2006. The London had been awarded the Games in 2005. The organization was still very small. That was one of the things that was incredibly appealing. If you look back on the time that I had spent at Goldman Sachs and how my career had developed, it started with a small, really kind of entrepreneurial business in London. Mm -hmm. with so that you knew everybody mm. and small so that you covered a range of things. And this was going to be a, an ability to go back to that. So rather than dealing with the budgets and the overall responsibilities and all the personnel management of 180 people across Europe and Asia, this was going to be different. You know, we were going to start small and then end up growing very quickly with mm -hmm. a different end in sight. And that was Fantastic. I would say in the first instance, I think this is the case when you start a new job for most people, you feel quite comfortable sometimes in the job that you've been in. I loved Goldman Sachs. I loved the job. I felt I navigated, as it were, the firm well. However, when I went to the organizing committee, so much new stuff that I could feel an almost sort of physical, you know, buzzing every day. This is great. I need to learn all these new things. I need to understand who the new stakeholders are. I need to understand what we're supposed to do. That was amazing, really energizing. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing was that the organizing committee was entirely a creature of, of the UK. I mean, mm -hmm. I had been part of an international business that was also, in some respects, very refreshing. Our mm -hmm. day began as a UK day and it ended as a UK day. Sometimes it was a very oh, long yeah. day. Yeah. Um, but you weren't waiting for New York to, you know, zoom in after lunch and then for Asia to be on the phone first thing in the morning. I mean, you had a very different kind of UK centric yeah. deal, which was also frankly appealing. And at the mm -hmm. same time, recognizing that, you know, the games are an international, you know, an international concept, an international set of principles. So you had that wider scope, but it was within an, an organization that was in the United Kingdom. Yeah. And and what were some highlights and lowlights of, I mean, there must have been some moments that were scary, I presume. But yeah, tell us about some highlights and lowlights and some of the things that you never thought you'd be doing in your career that happened during that time. Yeah. So I think the thing that I really always remember about London 2012 was the tremendous amount of willingness of people to do everything they could to help you reach your legal goals. Um, bearing in mind that this would be something that would never really generate much in the way of precedent, because you could always say, well, we only did that, you know, for, for the games. There were a lot of areas where we could work with government, which was very helpful in defining how we were going to go forward, you know, in terms of how the organization was set up, 
the relationship that we have with government, with the British Olympic Association, and then with quite specific things, how we were going to organize, for example, insurance across mm -hmm. all of the aspects of the game and games and how we um, developed, for example, the right relationships with both insurance brokers and with Pool Re, which is the terrorism um, sort of structure. So a lot of that stuff was really great. We would go into offices and it was, you know, you'd feel that you were one of the more exciting things that they were going to be talking about that day. Mm -hmm. People were always, I think, prepared to assist without Again, there was very little political tension. All of the political parties were united, which made it very, very much easier. I would say one of the big challenges we had, we we wanted to make sure we had the right kind of rigorous structure for brand protection. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that the International Olympic Committee is absolutely focused on. We developed a unique brand at that point, never seen before, which was the logo our, our famous logo, which mm -hmm. was developed as a stylized 2012 for the Olympic Games, and it had the same shape, but with different infills for the Paralympic Games. That was unprecedented. Mm -hmm. um, we needed to put in place the right structures to protect the use of that, and we also needed to deal with people wishing to use the Olympic rings, but not necessarily having the rights to do so. Um, and part of what I think we found challenging was some some of our partners across the different local authorities in the United Kingdom got very energetic about this, particularly towards the start of the games. There was there were things that we heard about that they were dealing with, which I would never have touched. I would have mm -hmm. just let that be. There was the butcher that had the rings in the shape of different colored sausages. <laughs> I would not have touched that. Just let him let him be that. There were people that had, you know, holding up painted signs as the torch relay went through mm -hmm. that were either very young or very old. Don't, you know, anybody under seven years old or, or over 75 years old I, that had something temporary or edible, mm -hmm. or, just, just don't do that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but people were very, I think, keen to embrace, mo you know, most of what we we felt they would really enjoy, which was great. And I think the significant challenges appeared quite late on mm -hmm. in our in our seven year history. As we got into the beginning of 2012, there was incessant rainfall. There was rain all the time. And that meant that the works that were being done to put up temporary grandstands and all of the temporary, uh, what we call the overlay for the games, everything was delayed. Um, Greenwich Park, which is where all the equestrian events were, was just a mud bowl. Mm -hmm. uh, and we ended up having to lay down wood chips across a fairly wide expanse of footpaths and also paths for the horses. If you went to Greenwich, there was definitely kind of woody smell in the air, but that was done as a matter of kind of emergency because mm -hmm. we couldn't deal with the ground otherwise. And then in addition to all the rain, we had a problem with the Hammersmith flyover um, was rendered unsafe. That was one of our major routes. So we knew, you know, that was a big issue. Nobody was going to be able to come into the city that way. We had big problems at the immigration and security control areas of people coming into Heathrow and Gatwick. There were problems with the number of staff. There were long delays. People were taking pictures of this on their iPhones. And then we had the G4S problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So G4S was, you know, they had been um, appointed to run security. Um, and within, I think it was in, I want to say, March or so of 2012, we became aware that they had significant problems. They couldn't find all of the people that they supposedly had contracted to provide security. And in early in July, it became apparent that they just were not going to be able to fulfill the contract. So we declared them in breach. We had a very good contract, which provided us with a lot of remedies. And they ended up providing the funding for all of the Plan Bs that we had to put into effect. And the Plan Bs were to have the armed services mm. provide security, as well as in some cities municipal police provided it, and all of that was paid for 
out of the G4S kind of damages clauses. It was very unnerving at that mm. point. The publicity was very unnerving at that point, because up until that point, it had been pretty good. I mean, a very supportive. And we, you know, just felt that this was something that we were going to need to get through, um, which we did. Um, I think once the torch relay came close to London, there became a groundswell of popular support. When the opening ceremony started, people loved the opening ceremony. The first few ga- days of the games were very good. The rain stopped. People saw what was happening and came back into the city, I think, if mm-hmm. they had tried to leave. We put all of the Paralympic tickets back on sale at that point, and they were sold out. Um, yeah. And the Paralympics became possibly even more of a wonderful event in the Olympics um, mm. because the stadiums were full. People had a fantastic time. There was rain in between the Olympics and the Paralympics, but not at the Olympics or at the Paralympics, which was great. Um, and so I think, you know, we we did get through it, but that was that was a very challenging thing. I think I wrote something like 25 different letters to G4S saying, we're not going to pay you. You're in breach. Mm-hmm. They're out every single day during the course of the games. I mean, I think the other challenge that we had was the occupation of St. Paul's, mm-hmm. uh, which we we were concerned that there was also going to be an occupation or a set of activities like that, both at Greenwich Park and at some of the final training venues. Mm-hmm. Um, it did end up having to get immediate action to remove some people who were occupying one of the training venues, but right. we didn't hold them. Yeah, yeah, and it obviously was an amazing event for London and an, and an, also the country and an amazing success. So what a fantastic thing to have been part of. But you know, did you have a real come down when it finished? And I guess there was there was still stuff to do after the games themselves. There was still work. How how long did you stay on afterwards? So we we very quickly began to reduce in size, and the final group that was left included. A few people from my team, people from finance, people from HR, and we put everything uh, into voluntary administration by the end of May of 20. So, And then there was a process that took a number of years to work through, were there any insurance claims? Were there issues? Everything was finally wound up. We gave quite a lot of money back to government, which had provided support in certain areas. And the whole thing was completely closed down. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it took really at least four or five years to do that, but it was. I don't think any other games has been able to do that. Yeah. Um, to close out every contract, to settle every claim, and tie everything up. So we were really pleased to be able to do that. Yeah, amazing. And then I was going to just talk to you a little bit about your current career, your sort of non-executive career. And I know you're currently a director of a number of Goldman Sachs entities and also your love of the British Equestrian Federation. I mean, how have you found, how do you find being a non-executive director versus being an executive? How have you found that transition? I think at first you you need to um, bear in mind that you're not, you're not running the business anymore. You're mm-hmm. there to oversee strategy and to understand what management is doing in order to advance the strategy. But I think for those of us who have had executive roles, you know, you do need to step back a little. I had the benefit of having at least a year of separation from the low cog role to when I went on to the board of a company, Mm -hmm. which was, um, but I think there were two lessons, I suppose, that I learned. The first was really listen more than talk. Um, Mm -hmm. One of the, one of my chairmen um, at some point said to me after I'd been on a board for a year, you know, Terry, you don't have to open your mouth, you know, in order for people to be aware that you've read the papers and that you understand the business. People will accept that you do that. You Mm -hmm. know, you need to listen a bit more. It isn't necessary to, to, you know, to, to actually, um, comment on every single thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's not really your job, if you see what I'm saying. And I think that was really good. Um, The second thing, I think, was to just make sure that you did have the right kind of opportunities to to make sure that you did understand the business, you know, Mm -hmm. that you read the materials, if there were questions in the materials, 
you didn't wait till the board meeting necessarily to ask them. I think all of the boards that I've sat on, the ones that have, you know, I think been the most effective have been where the organization has been willing to make sure that if necessary, um, members of the management team can explain yeah. or by the necessary perspective, um, which I find really, really helpful. It's important not to abuse that because mm -hmm. they've got a job. But if you make it clear that you want to be able to make sure that you've understood what it is, um, if, if, you know, if the organization should be able to offer the opportunity to give you a bit more education. And that's really, really valuable. Yeah, absolutely. And and do you have any advice for, you know, I talk to a lot of women who are really interested in going onto boards and sometimes I talk them through some of the practical things they can do to prepare. What what would your advice be for someone who's saying, look, maybe, you know, in the future I'd really like to go onto a board. Do you have any advice for how to prepare yourself? I think the first thing is to identify what kinds of sectors you might want to be involved with. And that doesn't mean necessarily the ones that you've already had expertise. And I didn't really focus in the first instance, for example, on financial services. Mm -hmm. The non-executive role that I had was at a construction company, Galliford Tri. I did have some understanding of construction contracts because of, that was part of what my team did at mm -hmm. LOCOP. But Generally speaking, the construction industry wasn't something that I was an expert in. Um, and so I think part of it is just deciding what appeals to you, what's attractive, um, and where you think you can lend value. I think it's really, really important to, um, if you go through the appointment process, the interview process, to use that as an opportunity for them to get to know you, obviously, but for you to get to know the board and the senior management as best you can, because the board actually has to function mm -hmm. as a group that works together well. You don't have to be, you know, all best friends or anything, but you do have to be um, absolutely willing and frankly to enjoy spending time together and working on challenges and understanding how, you know, you're lending value. So mm -hmm. that personal element is really important. I think having, I mean, I, everybody thinks about this in a somewhat different way, but I've been lucky, I think, as well to have had um, relationships with um, a couple of different recruitment firms mm -hmm. so that I know when they contact me that it's the sort of thing that I think is likely to be a good fit. Mm -hmm. And if you have that kind of relationship, it's really helpful. Um, the final point I would make is that the roles that i had as non-executive have, in a couple of instances, Goldman Sachs and Rothstein in particular, come from existing relationships that mm -hmm. I had to, not from the recruitment firm as such. Yeah. And this is just such an important lesson as you go through your career. You know, you've got so many opportunities to build relationships with people, even if they're on the other side of the case or on the other side of the table or on the other side of the deal. Every opportunity like that is the basis for somebody thinking, you know, I really enjoyed dealing with that person. I didn't like that they won or whatever. That's mm -hmm. what it is. I liked the way that they handled themselves. And I that might then trigger a memory if there's an opportunity or a position at their organization at some yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think it took me quite a long time to understand the importance of networking and, and having those re re broader relationships. I pro probably because I was in a law firm for so long and sort of by the time you become quite a senior, everyone sort of knows who you are and you know everyone. But I went to an amazing networking event last night with a lot of women who work in the city and, you know, and all of them were there wanting to help one another and support one another. It was, you know, it was very inspiring. And, and it was amazing how many people afterwards will come up with ideas to find people roles or help them with a new job or help them recruit someone. So yeah, making sure you do make the effort to go to those things, because usually when you're there, they're really energizing. It's just when you think about going at the end of the day, sometimes you're not so energized about the thought, but just go get there. And then, you know, you'll meet amazing people, but focus on that broadening of network, I think is, is really important. Ask people's advice, have your own little personal boards of board of directors can be really useful. So I'm now yeah. going to ask you for like your, what What would your three pieces of advice be looking back? Oh, I want to ask you, writing. Did, has writing ever come up again? Have you ever wanted to go back and sort of scratch that itch and do some writing? 
It's a really good question. I always thought that it was such a benefit that I had been a newspaper reporter in my mm -hmm. early career because it meant I wasn't frightened about sitting down and bashing out something quickly. Um, mm -hmm. These days, as you know, you know, you're doing a lot of stuff by email or, you know, God forbid by, I don't, but, you know, by iPhone or whatever. I mean, you're, you're sending things quite quickly because people want to know something. And I've never felt that that was a big obstacle. Sometimes people find it really difficult. Um, mm -hmm. you no, know, I, I, I haven't written the great American novel and I don't think I'm going to, or great, or great British novel. I don't think I'm going to do that um, now, but you know, I, I think there's opportunities to, to feel very, very glad that I was able to get the experience of writing under deadline um, yeah. and understanding the sources. My husband, by the way, thinks that since I went to law school, my writing style has completely deteriorated. <laughs> and I need to tick and tie everything before I say it. But right. um, <laughs> I disagree. But. <laughs> and yes, yeah, so, so I was going to ask you to wrap up. Like, what, when you look back to that young journalist or even, you know, further back to at school, what, what would your three pieces of advice be now to your younger self? I think one of the things that somebody told me early on, which has really stuck with me, is the value of the early no can rarely be overestimated. Mm. So what I mean by that is if you if you are, and this is often the case with the lawyer, and I think maybe even very typical of an in-house lawyer, somebody comes up with a great idea, they come to you, it's never going to work. And if you say to people, I'm really sorry, this is not going to work. If you say that early on, it mm -hmm. saves a lot of trouble. If you temporize, well, you know, I'm going to have to think about this or I'll come back to you or that, that's a great idea, but maybe we just need, you'll just go down a road where it will become harder and harder to extricate yourself. Mm -hmm. So the value of the early no can rarely be overestimated. I sometimes say that to myself. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's hard for people to do when they're yes. young. Maybe. Yes, yes. Um, so that's point one. Point two, I think one of the things that lawyers get a kind of, you know, difficult reputation for is that sometimes they seem happy to say no. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can, no, no, you can't do that. It's a little mm -hmm. bit the computer says no. And I found as well over the years that saying to people, look, I'm really sorry, valued the early no. I'm really sorry. It's got to be no. I'm mm -hmm. sorry about this because I know this was your pet project or whatever. However, let's sit down and think about if there's another way to do this. Uh, okay. Okay. So okay. it's, we're in no land at this point, but we might be able to get into yes land. If you need an answer today, it's no. If you can give me more time and give me more information, it might be a yes. I don't enjoy saying no. Mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? And I think that's sometimes been very helpful. And it mm -hmm. builds the right sort of relationship with the person that you're working with in, mm -hmm. in the side. Um, and then I think the final point, I, I find this really, really difficult to do myself. But when you've done something well, when you've done, you've had a difficult case that you've managed to work through, you've had a difficult set of problems, you've had a massive deal that you've worked with people and got it done, try, if you can, to enjoy it a mm -hmm, little bit. Mm -hmm. Because most of the time, you, you're beating yourself up for missing something or getting something a bit wrong. Um, but if you can enjoy it and think, you know, I really did that piece of it well, I did something well, I'm going to learn from that and, you know, build on that. I think that gives you additional confidence for going forward. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think those are things that you learn as you go along. I would say, by the way, that the the other thing, if you've made a mistake, immediate, this is the fourth thing, I suppose, immediately try to fess up. I yeah. made a mistake. It's my problem. I'm going to try and fix it. That you need to know this right away. Don't delay. Yeah. Um, don't think this is the advice I said about don't self medicate. It will just get worse and worse and worse. Um, yeah. And that again, really hard thing to be able to say that. But it's it's worked out in a couple of cases where that's happened. And I was in both cases quite young as a lawyer with person said, "Thank you so much for telling me that." Right. Right. We can move forward. Right. And yeah. that was very good. That was a very good response. And I think with with my teams, it was the sort of thing that I wanted to say to them as well. Thank you for telling me. Let's just walk through this. Yeah. 
I mean, it is. It's one of those scary things. But you're right. The longer it stays with you, the scarier it gets. And also there's a risk that the issue gets worse. But it definitely gets scarier if you just bite the bullet and go and do it. Yeah, that's great yes. advice. But definitely also about giving yourself credit. And it's interesting that you find, so even you find that hard, like look, looking back at something and going, you know what, I did that really well. Yeah, because you always think it's a hostage to fortune, right? Mm -hmm. And I think particularly with lawyers, sometimes there's a very long tail on some of these things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but I think, I think if you can do that, the point is that, you know, you want to keep building from the experience that you've had and in order to do that, you need to say, yes, I recognize that I did that piece of it. Well, maybe I didn't the other piece of it all that well, but that part of it I did well and I can apply that going forward. Good. Excellent. Well, look, thank you so much for your time today, Terry. I'm glad, I'm really glad that we finally got to meet. Yeah. And, and it's been really, really lovely to spend time with you. So thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Good. Fantastic.